So I begin by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the land on which I stand and am hosting from today. In the spirit of reconciliation, NEABPD Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We also acknowledge people with lived experience of mental ill health and recovery and the experience of people who have been carers, families and supporters. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Belinda. I will be your host today. I work and volunteer for NEABPD Australia in our virtual head office. Uh, and I'm also a uh, trained family connections leader. I am also a loved experience um, person. So I do have a family member who has BPD as well. Um, as you probably know, we're a not-for-profit we deliver programs, webinars and events to support families, carers and people in a relationship with someone who has BPD or BPD traits and whether there is a formal diagnosis or not. Today, we are very grateful from, from a presentation from Alison and Alex, who are a couple of 20 years, which is very respectable, the both of you. Uh, they've both walked a life of mental health challenges together. Um, and they're here today to discuss how their relationship has been, what their learnings have been over the time together, challenges, and also how family connections has helped them to navigate the complex world of big emotions in a relationship. Thank you so much, Alison and Alex, for making time for us and our audience. Welcome. Thank you very much, Belinda. It was a lovely introduction. So um, hello everybody, it's so wonderful to be here. I would just like to thank you all for, for coming and it's such a pleasure to basically talk to our NEA BPD audience, our BPD um, lovelies and our lived experience people and our precious, valuable, wonderful carers. We're so thrilled to be here. And this, I'm Alison Lee and this is my husband and partner of 20 years, Alex Lee. And it's our pleasure to talk to you today about our 20 year relationship and how we've navigated many of the challenges that have been brought in our relationship due to strong emotions and emotional dysregulation. Yes, we have just hit our 20 year mark as a couple and of those 20 years, we've been married for 11 years. And when I tell people how long Alex and I have been together, the reaction is normally, but you two aren't that old. And I'm like, yes, correct, we're not. I'm I'm actually 41, Alex is 43. We met at a party when I was 19, Alex was 21. But when we tell people that I have received a diagnosis of BPD and I am also living with complex trauma, people's reactions change and they just tend to go, how? How on earth has this worked for so long? And truth be told, we actually don't really have a definitive answer to that question. And in a lot of ways, we're just your average, boring, long-term married couple. We like cats, we like simple nights in, and we have a lot in common, but it's really been a slow and not so easy journey to get to this point. Now, uh, another question that we often get a lot is whether or not Alex knew that I had BPD when we got together. And I can say that he didn't have a clue. Neither of us did. When we started dating, I had officially been diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety disorder and a social phobia. And looking back, it's really frustrating when I, I think about that diagnosis because I felt that they had missed something very important, that something was off. And it wasn't until I was 27 that I was diagnosed with BPD and I was diagnosed with complex trauma several years ago. And when Alex and I began dating, I was upfront about my struggles with depression. And luckily for me, he did not run away. Back in my late teens and my early 20s, which I call my pre-Alex days, I had some encounters with the mental health system, which left me very shaken. So when Alex and I first got together, I was still grappling with very intense bouts of anger and depression and my emotions were all over the place. And I'd had times where I would get really angry, really depressed and really upset and just crawl into bed and hibernate there for days. I knew that I needed help. 
but I was terrified to dive back into a system that had previously let me down so badly. And despite these very turbulent episodes in the first five or so years of our relationship, I did manage to keep up appearances for the most part. I was able to function, so to speak. I could go to university and I held down a job poorly, but I still held it down. And I could somehow contain my suicidal ideations and my desire to self-harm. But all of that tension was building up within me. A lot of people thought, well, maybe she's over it. Maybe she's recovered. But the truth is I wasn't well at all. And the inevitable happened. I had a breakdown when I was 27. I made an attempt in my life. I was hospitalized. And that is when I was diagnosed with BPD. Um, but after the diagnosis, things began to make more sense for us as a couple. We had a clearer picture of what we were dealing with. And I began to see my struggles through the lens of developmental trauma, but I still felt that a big piece of my puzzle was missing. Despite the diagnosis, I still had very intense dissociative episodes. I had panic attacks, I had nightmares, and I had emotional flashbacks. And these things aren't really explained by the BPD diagnosis. So when a few years ago we got the diagnosis of complex trauma, things made even more sense. So we have a lot of empathy out there with the uh, consumers and the carers that are caring for them. It's very difficult to know how to help your loved one when you haven't received the full spectrum, the diagnostic spectrum, and you really have no clue what you're dealing with. Um, but after the diagnosis, things did change for us as a couple in a lot of ways, because Alex, being the fantastic partner that he is, decided to take a more direct role in my care. He decided to start his own home business, because I think after the circumstances um, that underlied my hospitalization, he was terrified to leave me alone, which was understandable. And this period for us was like walking on eggshells, because I still felt hopeless and I still felt a lot of despair, and my symptoms intensified. We developed a lot of coping strategies to deal with my dysregulation, but a lot of them weren't that helpful. The main one we had was avoidance. We didn't really have a lot of difficult conversations, but when we did, they were almost always misattuned or they would result in me having a meltdown. Now, Alex is naturally a very gentle and a very caring person and a kind soul, and he was always very well-intentioned, but there were moments when we struggled to express ourselves very effectively and I found it very difficult to communicate my needs in the relationship in a way that wasn't damaging for both of us. Um, we also faced a lot of challenges with boundaries, which might surprise some people. And at times it felt like I was begging Alex to set boundaries on my behaviour. Still, he was very hesitant to do that. And I, I will admit that I did used to provoke him to try and get him to set these boundaries. And I used to do some pretty outlandish things to try and get his attention. I remember one time I went out and I came back with a completely shaved head. I was like, hi, honey, like my new do. Um, I used to go on very spontaneous spending sprees and spend money that we didn't have. And one time he went out to work. And after that, I went to Bunnings and came home. And then when he arrived home that day, he found me painting a house, a room in my house, a completely different color. I was like, hey, honey, like my new spontaneous home renovation. I wanted him to notice me doing these outlandish things and to try and stop me because that to me at the time was sort of the proof that he cared. But throughout it all, we were still together because we did have a deep love there. We always have had, and neither of us considered giving up an option we still had a very deep desire to connect, even though he did struggle to understand my behavior and I couldn't really explain what I was going through. And when I would say harsh and critical things about myself, Alex would say things like, I wish you could see yourself through my eyes. And whilst this is um, a really beautiful sentiment, it was a challenge for me to fully accept that kind of love because it was so different to what I had experienced during my childhood. But Alex didn't base his love for me on any kind of expectations, and I loved him quite deeply for that. Um, what was difficult for me was seeing the impact that my suffering had on Alex. I remember one hospital visit. I was waking up in um, an ED bed, 
and I saw Alex sitting on a chair by the side of the bed and he was hunched over and he had his head in his hands and I just thought, I think I've ruined this poor man's life. And in the past, I used to wonder if I was holding him back, if he regretted the day that he chose to be with me or if I was a burden to him. So I would like to say that for any caregivers wondering if your loved ones understand the impact of their distress upon you, we absolutely do. I will assure you of that. If anything, knowing that our suffering has hurt you intensifies our distress. It makes us feel more helpless as much as what we experience in terms of dysregulation is actually beyond our control. But in our mid-30s, we both seem to calm down quite naturally. I decided to take my treatment more seriously and I made brave decisions to tackle my childhood trauma. I received EMDR, which helped me enormously and very quickly. We both uh, committed to communicating far more calmly than we had in the past. So we had no more screaming matches and that was a wonderful thing. But there was still quite a lot of misattunement. I had a lot of distress and Alex, although he was always well-intentioned, didn't really still have any skill in calming me down. Um, things only took a turn for us in this regard when I was hospitalised several years ago and I received my diagnosis of complex trauma because we both were put in touch with services that were designed to help us. And one of these services was this lovely little organisation called NEABPD. Alex was hooked up with and we did a lovely little course. Alex did a course called Family Connections and that was actually sort of pivotal for us because there was a massive change in how he dealt with my issues after that course. I would like to talk to you about a, a really amusing incident that sort of demonstrates the impact of family connections on Alex. We were driving somewhere and I was getting really upset in the car and I can't even remember what I was upset about, but my voice was sort of going up into the Mariah Carey whistle register as I was just screaming and I could see Alex getting his facial muscles were beginning to twitch and he had his hands on the wheel and he was gripping it tightly and his knuckles were going white and he turned to me and he said, honey, and I thought, oh God, I'm going to get chewed out. We're going to have an argument. And he was like, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm hearing that you're very frustrated right now. And I just want to let you know that that is a completely valid emotion. And I just stopped. You know, in bushfire seasons on TV, when you see those, those Elvis helicopters that have the water in their bellies and then they open up and then they douse bushfires and you see the bushfire beneath it go, tss. that's what it felt like. My distress in that moment went from about an eight to a two. And I was just absolutely floored by what Alex had said. And I really only had two thoughts going through my mind at that time was A, that was precisely what I needed to hear. And B, that isn't something that Alex would have ordinarily said in that situation. And I turned to him and I said, honey, that was amazing. Where did you learn how to do that? Did your family connections to us, of course, teach you that? And I could see a smile lighting up Alex's face. And he said under his breath, oh my God, that does work. And we both looked chuffed for the rest of the day. I really don't think Alex could believe it either. And I would like to say that I think that the team that developed the Family Connections course gets it because when you're dealing with a loved one who struggles with emotional dysregulation, we often get into an argument about facts and it's not about the facts. Previously, when Alex and I argued, it was about my interpretation of the facts, which was counterproductive because I will admit that my interpretation of reality can be a bit out there. In that situation, we need attuned communication. We need for the person we're speaking with to focus on the emotional distress that underlies our interpretation of the facts. So we need for our, our person to recognize the emotion that we're feeling, to name it and to reflect it back to us and validate it. And the best thing about this skill is that you don't have to correctly name the emotion all the time. It's just the attempt to connect on on that level that will make the difference there have been times where Alex has used that statement I can tell that you are feeling blank emotion in this situation and I can understand that that's a, a very valid emotion and I'm like no actually I'm not feeling that emotion I'm actually feeling something else it's the fact that you have attempted to name that emotion that helps me to clarify what I'm feeling 
And so I'm now in touch with myself and that reduces my distress naturally. Also, I will say that family connections have helped Alex to set boundaries with me. And again, despite everything you may believe or have seen to the contrary, particularly um, the stereotypes concerning women with BPD, it is very likely that your BPD loved one is craving firm boundaries. We don't want punitive boundaries, but we want limits on what is acceptable and what you're willing to take from us because that increases our sense of security. So the skills that Alex has learned in family connections like Dear Man has helped us with this. And I can tell that whenever Alex sits me down and starts a sentence with, now, honey, in this situation, when such and such happened and you did this, I would just like to let you know that that made me feel this way. And in the future, I would like to see such and such behavior from you. Would that be acceptable to you? And it works because it lets me know what I can, can and can't get away with. And the best bit about it is that it's a very gentle approach. It's non-punitive and it's non-judgmental. It comes from a place of great care and concern for your loved one and a desire to keep the relationship intact. It does result in changed behavior because I would never deliberately hurt Alex. And now I know for the most part how to avoid irritating him. So there won't be any more spontaneous home renovations, so to speak. Um, I finally realized what family connections had done for me a few months ago when I was reading a textbook on developmental psychology and I was learning about attachment styles and emotionally attuned caregiving when I realized, oh my God, I get it now. I now have an attuned carer and I have developed attachment security. So I think what Family Connections did for us was remarkable. It equipped Alex with the skills to bring harmony into our lives, uh, to effectively connect with me and to alleviate my distress. And this transformation for me made him a secure anchor upon which I could rebuild my life. So a lot of wonderful things have happened for us since we took Family Connections. I have um, patched up my inability to trust the system and I've been able to reach out for support to other care providers, which has also made Alex's caregiving responsibilities a lot lighter. I've forged lasting friendships, which is a very significant achievement for me. Uh, we've been able to engage in local advocacy networks, uh, regional advocacy networks, and now national advocacy networks. We've shared our stories at multiple international academic conferences, which has been amazing. And now I'm a part of the lived experience workforce. And I'm very proud of that because several years ago, I was in such a state of despair that I thought I would never work again. I have shifted from merely existing to having a life worth living. Alex has also evolved and our relationship works on a different level, a better level. So we're ready to face challenges and embrace the future and everything that it brings. And I'm fairly certain now that the relationship insecurity I experienced in the past it will be remaining in the past. And as someone that has benefited immensely from the training you gave to Alex, I can't express enough gratitude to NEA BPD for all that you do. Thank you for your time and listening to my story. I would like now to hand over to my lovely husband, Alex. That was lovely. I am very sure that I still got an awful lot to learn and I'm sure that what Alison said made me sound a lot better than I've really done but anyway yes I my name's Alex I am Alison's support person I just want to acknowledge all the carers and support people out there that some of you may prefer the term carer some of you may prefer support person family or another term I understand that that term means different things to different people. So whatever you're happy with, I am more than happy to um, go with that. And also acknowledge all the work that all the carers, family, supporters do for our people who experience uh, mental health challenges and emotional distress. I see you and I do hear you. I guess Alison has explained a lot about where our story is. So just to briefly say that, yes, we've been together for 20 years and married for about 11. And But for the most part of that, I was actually fumbling around the system quite blindly because no one has, despite numerous interactions with various health systems, public and private, no one's really asked how I was until the recent hospitalization that Alison was talking about. That was about 
two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, it, and it is a story that as I travel to care a journey, I keep hearing over and over again that, yes, yeah, sure, the medical attention is rightly given to our person who is experiencing the distress, but us as carers also have a need to be supported. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago, that last interaction with the system, that one of the clinicians actually pulled me aside and asked me, uh, so Alex, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Naturally, I started answering stuff about Alison. I was saying, oh, yeah, she's been doing X, Y, Z. She's been doing this, doing that. And she went, no, 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 Alex. No, 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 no. How are you doing, Alex? You. That really took me to, to, that really took me by, by surprise because I was thinking, hang on, I'm not the one in distress here. Why are you asking me? But because, well, the clinician was pretty nice. So I um, and she gave me a whole bunch of resources. And one of them was, as Alison said, getting in touch with NEA BPD and joining in with the Family Connections program, which I did sign up for and join and that was uh, about 18 months ago, La A March, April 2022. Yeah, so I went through that program, 12 weeks of two hours a night. And yes, I am actually going to say that it was absolutely life-changing for me personally. I just want to say two things about the Family Connections program, that how, how it made me feel. First one is about other participants in the program. Everyone, everyone there has got a unique story, different people that they look after. Some of them look after their children. Some of them look after their um, elderly relatives. Some of them look after a partner. But it, and everyone brings a unique perspective about their own lives into it. But despite that, Yes, initially, first couple of weeks, everyone's trying to get to know each other and get a sense of what each other is like. But as the program went on, two, three weeks later, I think we grew together. I think the entire group actually grew individually as persons together, as carers. And also, we were able to hold pretty difficult conversations I mean, initially, there was a lot of distress, a lot of need, desire to let a lot of things off our chests. But as the weeks went by, we became more, I guess, skillfully vulnerable. By that, I mean, yes, we are saying things that are relating to us personally, but we are also relating them to our own what we're learning from the program. We're just we're not just there saying getting things off our chest but we're relating it to our own experiences which is difficult to do it you know talking about your own distress as a carer that is hard to do but I was so grateful that everyone in my group were able to use their lived experience in such a way to reinforce each other's learning to help each other grow and I am definitely very um, grateful for that. And in fact, we had people from the group who, well, everyone's from Australia, but actually had people in the group who went away on holidays to, in I, I think, Southeast Asia and actually caught into on, on, our, on, on our little nightly appointments. And I remember one of those meetings, I was actually in Canberra for a conference and I dialed in on my way back to the hotel and I thought, oh yeah, I'm the person furthest away from this meeting. And then someone rang in and said, oh, I'm in Southeast Asia. So yeah, that shows the dedication of the people who are joining in and really want to get something out of the group. And all this cannot happen without the second thing I want to talk about, and that's our facilitator. I won't mention them by name, but I because uh, I didn't get permission to. But if you're listening, hi, and I'm super grateful for what our facilitator has done. They are super knowledgeable and not just about what's on paper about family connections, but also relating to their own lived experience as a family, as a carer, in demonstrating what the what what the program what the contents were about 
but most importantly gave a lot of space to hear our stories and our distress and a lot of this is actually about people needing to get something off their chest especially in the first couple of weeks because I, I was a bit like that I had never really had an opportunity or a sympathetic or empathetic audience where I can talk about what has been bugging me basically and then as the weeks went on as I said we all all diving into our own lived experiences to reinforce what we learned from the course and a lot of that was difficult and a lot of that required a lot of space holding just listening just without judgment without necessarily diving in for a solution and our facilitator did that really brilliantly and I remember in the last final couple of weeks where we were talking about radical acceptance which is a very, very difficult concept. I'm still coming to terms with it. That's why they put it at the final couple of weeks because it's not for the faint of heart. And there were some pretty difficult emotions experienced by some of the participants and our facilitator was able to basically hold that space, listen to what the concerns were and validated them. And I found that, so important for us carers who a lot of us may may not have had the opportunity to as i said talk to someone who's got that empathetic ear so that was really fantastic other the other participants in the group and the facilitators in family connections i'm super super appreciative of them I learned a huge amount of things from doing family connections but i'm going to summarize three of them First one that I got was don't dive into problem solving mode. I don't know if it's because I'm a male, because I have a certain kind of work ethics, but there had been a previous time in my life when Alison comes to me with feelings of distress or just feeling dysregulated. And straight away, I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Tell me, tell me what's going on. I need, uh, uh, what, what, what's making you feel this way? And I very quickly learned that that is probably not the best approach. <laughs> but also, to re but I, I, I realized that a lot of times it's better to sit with the distress, sit with the difficulty and the uncertainty because it, it, it gives that space for, and it comes down to, and it, it, it also comes to what I'm going to say next to validation. I'm giving the second point away already, but it's difficult to, I guess, validate her emotions if I am too busy staying my own peace. And also another thing is that I learned that my tendency to problem solve probably came from needing to deal with myself. What I mean is when I ask her, what's wrong? Tell me. I said, well, how can I help you? I am actually soothing my own distress. Because I've got perhaps a low tolerance for distress. I wasn't able to sit in that uncomfortable space. And it manifests in a, it, it, it made me want to know what's going on. How do I solve it? How do I end that distress? When all I really needed to do is to just sit in that, sit in that discomfort, let her talk it out. Because one of the things that our facilitator said, which really stuck with me, was when you're communicating with your loved one, would you rather be right or would you rather be effective? Sure, if I want to get to the bottom of a problem, I'm asking, how do I become, how do I make this right? But is this necessarily an effective way to handle my person's distress? So yes, number one, don't immediately problem solve. Number two, as I said, validation. It's just when I, that that concept, as Alison said, in her little anecdote about us driving in a car, absolutely it was a game changer. Just to realize that I can do a lot more by 
keeping a space for my for for Alison's distress and her story and validate the feelings. And we did a lot of that in the group itself. Like I said, every participant came with their own story and sometimes they share a bit about what's been going on. And we learned pretty quickly that, no, don't jump in with solutions, but learn to validate, learn to, learn to say that, yes, I can hear that your emotions are valid. It is okay to have that emotion. And one of the key things that I learned was that you can validate basically anything. Like just because you 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 may or may not agree with your what your person is saying. Like even if your person says things that you completely disagree with, but I learned that I can still validate the feeling behind that, whether it be anger, whether it be frustration, sadness. The simplest thing I can say even is, Yes, I can hear that you're feeling very angry. I don't even have to agree with what what what, what the person said. Half the time, I don't agree with what she says. No. But it's the feeling that I'm validating, which I found super helpful. Now, I've had carers asking me, if I say that all the time, does that mean I'm giving in to everything? Like, am I being trampled all over? Like, Alison can say anything and I'm just validating am i being walked all over the answer lies in the third thing that i learned is that it's setting boundaries and it's the, the, the whole question of boundaries everybody in my course wanted to know about it like they were asking from week two week three oh my person is behaving in xyz way how do i set a boundary and it's big. And I'm um, spoiler alert. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> do, do the course, <laughs> uh, but it is no, not because I don't want to say it, but it's just because it is. It's a difficult skill. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put my hand up and say I'm still learning that massively. I'm pra trying to practice it every day, not necessarily with Alison, but just with people, situation in my life. But I think the key things that I can summarize out of my own learning about boundaries, I can sum it up in three ways. One, I got to know what my values are and be ready to defend it. Because if I don't even know what I value, how do I set boundaries about it? And that requires a fair bit of introspection, thinking about what is really my bottom line. I mean, I used to have arguments with Alison about how to stack the dishwasher. I think I was doing that a couple of weeks ago, even. But I have to sit there and think, does it really matter how a dishwasher is stacked? Like, pick my I, I gotta learn to pick my own battle to understand that, hey, maybe a dish how how to stack a dishwasher isn't a fundamental part of who I am. And how happy to let that go. The second thing that I learned about boundary setting is that, like I said, knowing validation, knowing that validation doesn't mean I have to validate with the contents of what is being said. For example, I'm not saying that Alison does does this, but if your person says something that I disagree with, disagrees with you politically, like you hold one political belief and the other person holds a completely different one and they say things that are quite different from what you think you don't have to agree with you don't have to validate the contents of it you can validate the feelings behind it yes i can hear that you're very annoyed by xyz politician and that is that does more than talking about facts and finally if i could give one strategy about setting a boundary is that it is okay to walk away temporarily i mean if the I, I I've done it with Alison. Like if she's clearly not listening, if she's clearly in a space where she feels highly dysregulated, I can say I'm going to walk away for five minutes. I'm just going to go for a walk and get a drink. And I will come back and check back on you in five minutes. I think the coming back to check back on you in five minutes things is super important because one of the one of the um, 
pain points of Alison's is about abandonment. So I have to make very clear that I am not abandoning her. I will absolutely come back to you, but I need to take some space and walk away for a bit. So, yeah, so know my own values and defend what they are. Know that validation doesn't mean I have to agree with the contents. And one strategy is that I can feel I can walk away for that five, 10 minutes. So I guess to finish off, my hopes for everybody out there, whether or not you're doing family connections or you're going to, is that families can, that I, I hope that families can stay together. It's, there's a lot of families who don't or are really struggling to because they're struggling with the person's big emotions. I think that doing this course really helped us to, to achieve that. I really love to see family and carers get the support and validation for themselves, not just because of their person, but for themselves. And we, our, our family connections group has an sort of an alumni program. We meet up once a month on Zoom and just to go through, just to talk about what we learned and um, also other life situations. And I found that really helpful and that was really great. And finally, what I would really love to see is family and carers lived experience being valued by our um, by our services in terms of becoming, for example, becoming peer support workers, having family and carer voices in how services are being designed. Because any of BPD um, family connections absolutely fantastic, but if all this can, if the environment that is being generated here can be translated to a wider set of services because family and carers are being more involved, that would be a world I would dearly love to see. Yeah, so that's my journey. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. It's been really heartwarming listening to you share your story. Um, I'm sure that everyone here has really appreciated your vulnerable, open and authentic sharing. Uh, and I'm sure there may be some questions as well. So I've opened up the chat. Um, so please now anyone feel free to send any questions that you might have through to um, Alison and Alex. And I'll get some of the pre-submitted questions up so we can start there. How does that sound? Sounds fantastic. Yep. You'd think I would have done this before, but I think I was just <laughs> really interested in what you had to say. You both spoke really well. Uh, okay, here we go. <clears throat> so a bit of question here first for Alison. Um, do BPD symptoms and issues or episodes get easier to handle as the person gets older? Um, I, I really, really like that question. And uh, from my lived experience is that there are some symptoms of BPD that will get better over time. And I think the literature actually supports that the impulsivity aspect of BPD gets better as you get older. I would actually say from a lived experience perspective that it gets better because I do not have the energy to generate the amount of chaos that I once did. I, I don't really have the energy to go out to Bunnings and spontaneously repaint rooms. And I really like my hair. I don't want to shave it off. You do, your personality does naturally settle down over time, I think, but I have actually benefited from some really great community services from Peer Worker and of course, Alex, which has been a stabilizing influence. And that's probably one of the reasons why we wanted to do this seminar is because when the carer is attuned, I, I do think that we, we do actually naturally settle, particularly as we get um, more skilled at dealing with distress over time. So we need attuned caregivers and people that give us that support because it will actually calm us down. So in terms of that distress over time, yes, there is hope that your symptoms will improve, hopefully. This is my lived experience, though. I can't really answer for people that are still experiencing distress in their 50s or 60s. That can happen. Um, but from the way I see it, there is a lot of hope. And I think the stats do reflect that as well. I, 
I think, don't quote me, but I think it's around 80% of people mm-hmm. will see a, a um, subsiding of, of their symptoms. A natural remission, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a natural remission, that's right. Uh, thank you for answering that one. Uh, for Alex, how do you take care of yourself? And I guess the, there's another question here. Are there any self-soothing mantras you say to yourself in order to keep calm? Self-care, that is such a great question and it is something that I'm still grappling with. I I have never been much a very good self-care person and to all of the carers out there, especially – we we we're all we we have our net regular jobs we have our caring responsibilities etc cetera, etc cetera, whatever you do we hardly have a minute to breathe so the whole talk about self care would sound a bit self indulgent but what I've learned is that I actually have to really defend that time and what I'm saying actually comes from a fair bit of counselling work that I received so you are getting um. Yeah, uh, yeah, quite a fit. My my counsel, my counselor should probably charge for this, but um, just got to defend that time and ultimately ask, okay, if I'm going to let the person know that I'm going to spend the next hour, I don't know, reading, um, going for a walk, what is going to be the likely outcome? And also, got to would would think about what are some of the strategies that the person could take in if they come if they become distressed during that time you're away and that of course that plan has to be done when the person feels relatively up to it um can't do it when the house is already on fire i personally i like reading i like going for a walk and even just taking a very deep breath I found tremendously helps. So, yeah, defend. Hopefully, you can find your time and defend it. Great answer. Um, we get this question a lot, and we get a lot of the themes around this question. Um, and it's how how do we support our person? Um either to seek a diagnosis or to get help, maybe not even to seek a diagnosis, but how do we support them to get help when they themselves might not uh, understand that what their experience is, emotional dysregulation or or BPD? Um, do you have any answers for that? Either of you two? Well, um, I, I can actually relate to that from a lived experience perspective because in our early relationship, it's like I mentioned in our speech, I'd been traumatised by my contact with the mental health system. I was actually um, involuntarily placed in an IPU and that scarred me quite badly. I was terrified to seek out help again for fear that that would happen again. So um, unfortunately for me, it got to the stage where uh, my distress got to the stage where I was uh, hospitalised again and that's not what we want to see. I, I think a good way to go about it would be learning some of the skills, the, the DBT skills, such as saying, I am actually noticing that you're in distress right now. Do you want to talk about it? And maybe even gently suggest that there are other resources out there to not sort of bat them over the head about it, like your behaviour is bothering me and blah, 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 you need help. Don't say that. That will result in your loved one becoming quite distressed and defensive. I think a, a gentle approach is best. We we would open up to it. We We know that we're in distress and we know that we're not happy. The gentle approach is best. Would you like to? No, I think you have summed it up that? pretty well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you did sum it up really well, Alison. And I think that it's a it's a tough um, situation, you know, to watch someone that you love struggle, and mm. um, and in a way, it can be easy for us from that other perspective to say, well, you need to do this, this and this because this is what's going to help you. But we have to let go a little bit and mm-hmm. understand that it's this person on their journey that's experiencing this and 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 probably one of the best places to start is, is on ourselves. Um, 
someone has asked the question of would the tactics for supporting and calming a person um, still work if the person doesn't realise they have BPD and family connections yeah. certainly um, we don't need we don't need people to prove that they have a diagnosis of of BPD for their family members to come and get support with us. We talk about it from an emotional dysregulation perspective, and certainly, I'm sure you can testify, Alex. A lot of the work, a lot of the the course contact is actually focusing on us improving our own communication strategies. It's not about us really helping. It is helping the other person. But it's really about reframing so much stuff inside ourselves um, and enabling us to have a better relationship. And no? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's about us. Doing this course is about us as carers. Yeah. I, I went in thinking that, oh, how am I going to help Alison with it? But it's a, it's more indirect than that. You, you're yes. absolutely correct there. Yes. I also think that um, a, a misconception is that DBT is only for people in distress. DBT skills are life skills. They will help yes. you in any situation, in, in the yes. workplace, dealing with difficult people. You really yeah. don't have to have an official diagnosis per se for a DBT skill to be helpful to you. A hundred percent. All right. Next question. Um, okay. How do you navigate being there for your partner with BPD when they are needing to create some distance and seem to push you away? I, I used to get distressed about that. I used to think that, oh, stuff you, you don't want to talk to me. But then that's but that comes back to the whole what I said about do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And even though I might have been right, oh you you just want to push me away, but that's not an effective response. So sometimes Alison does go, oh yeah, I feel uh, go away, go away. And I personally would take that opportunity to just real it will do what i said before about do I, what i said i would be doing that is to take that five ten minutes and say i will come back and see how you are because if i i found that if i kept pushing the issue if allison tells me to go away it's going to make it worse it will make it feel like smothering and and it's yeah, it will not make it better. I mean, obviously, the story is different if um, if we're talking about like actual self harm or dangerous activities. Yes, you have got to get immediate help. But if it's simply a matter of no, go away, then I do find that that five ten minute timeout is very helpful. It, it's diff It's going to be difficult on me as a carer, but it it's helpful. I, I will actually say from the lived experience perspective that when your BPD loved one tells you to go away, we don't really want you to go away. We just want to be left alone for a little while because we we do love you and need you. And uh, it's it's quite interesting experiencing that. It's like your brain is going in two directions. This person's presence is really bothering me right now, but I love them so much. Please don't leave me for long. So this approach, this I'll come back to you in five minutes when you've sorted yourself out a little bit is, is the best way to go about it, I think. Don't storm out or give the impression that you're going to go away for good don't threaten to like leave the relationship or anything that that will not help. <laughs> um, we've had a lot of questions come through, have curiosity around mm -hmm. your EMDR, mm -hmm. um, uh, Alison. Yeah. How it, it's supported you. It's, uh, well, um, I actually received EMDR before I got a complex trauma diagnosis. I got it through victim support services. I'd made a complaint to the police about something that I'd been through and I received EMDR in preparation for a, a court case in which I would have been expected to bring up traumatic memories. And what it did for me was it reduced the emotional charge behind those memories. So it actually... Um, I can actually think about those memories or when they come into my head, they don't distress me in the way that they used to anymore. But I'm actually quite concerned with some of the questions that are coming up. Because for me, it um, it stopped some of my flashbacks. But I, I it's it's quite it's quite interesting um if we 
EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And it's based on the idea that um, trauma is due to an incomplete um, nervous system response. So you, you still believe that you're in the thick of the traumatic experience that, that scarred you, that harmed you. And so what it does, it actually completes that trauma response so that you can sort of process your traumatic memories and it just goes back into you know, the, the nether regions of your brain the same way that yesterday's breakfast would be. Um, for me, it was helpful, but I can only really speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. I'm really, I'm really not happy to hear about that. Some people have had a, a distressing experience with EMDR. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. And from my understanding, uh, and I have a limited understanding, um, you know, uh, CPTSD is certainly a, a, a trauma, a condition that has developed from trauma. And we know now that BPD is not always a, a, a development from a, a trauma situation, mm -hmm. but almost certainly many people with who, who do experience BPD have probably been in some fairly traumatic situations. Um, and so maybe EMDR might be a suitable uh, solution for them. But I mean, we don't provide EMDR and we don't provide um, a lot of information on it. So we can't really right. also advise for or against. Um, EMDR is not um, particularly a recommended treatment for BPD per se anyway. It's more for um, PTSD and complex PTSD. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've dropped off the questions because I had a... Uh, a uh, a small dependent human asked me for snacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a little side quest question as well here. Um, wondering um, about co-occurring conditions. Um, uh, this question is is asking: Is rejection sensitivity dysphoria um, part of your journey? My seventeen year old suffers from this in relation to social anxiety. Um, she was originally diagnosed with this rejection sensitivity dysphoria as part of her ADHD, but has now been told that she has BPD. Um, okay. Um, I guess the question there is they're, mm -hmm. they're asking, yeah, have you also experienced RSD? We are, as lived experience people with BPD, hypersensitive to rejection and that comes down to the diagnostic criteria intense fear of abandonment real or imagined and I can tell you that that has been a massive part of my lived experience not so much with Alex but with friends it seems to have manifested in that area and um, I've I, I've struggled to reach out and make friends and I've in my time I've been a world champion ghoster I will just sort of um, deal with my abandonment anxiety by cutting off contact with somebody spontaneously, automatically for no reason. It is very difficult to deal with when um, to put your heart on the line and render yourself vulnerable to someone that might reject you when you have BPD. That is absolutely a part of the lived experience of BPD. There's no way around it. Sorry. <laughs> it's a part of the diagnostic criteria. And learning the skills such as the ones that we, we teach in Family Connections certainly helps i mean alex you you've talked about that i'll come back in five minutes i just need some time to, to myself to process um and i want to also note here that we all experience emotional dysregulation oh. it's part of being human and so by being able to just catch ourselves and say i'm i'm feeling really overwhelmed here i'm going to go and take time out and regulate myself so then i can come back and be present and, and be here with you and get a bit more of an understanding. Um, definitely Family Connections teaches us more, better skills in those interpersonal skills of how to communicate and how, how to relate there, um, which hopefully is helping people um, not feel as deeply that the rejection and, and that sensitivity there. Um, we have... A losing it here. Just start to get a lot of questions come through. Um, 
We're having a bit more questions around the trying to set boundaries. Um, I'll say that in Family Connections, we call it setting limits. Um, would you be either of you two feel comfortable talking about um, a bit more about the setting boundaries or the setting limits? Yes, happy to do that. Oh, it does come a fair bit la fairly late on in the in family connection because I think that there are some more foundational skills for it, for example, being able to hold space for each other and validation that we need to know before being able to uh set those set those limits. And also, like I said, a lot of it comes down to what you believe is truly important to you. And a phrase that popped up quite a bit in our course was to pick our battle. And for the battles that don't directly impinge upon our personal, like deeply held values, we say we put on our our um Teflon suit. I know it sounds really passive and it sounds like, oh, it means that everyone's got to walk all over you. But I think the exercise of clarifying my own values and defend those ones, I found it helpful. And also it means that it removes a certain element of control. I think one of the questions was asking about how does it, how do I impose limits without sounding like I'm controlling mm -hmm. And I think I this is just me personally, but if I try to fight too many battles, I would say that I would come across as very controlling, like I said about the dishwasher thing. So it, it's a very fine it's a very fine balance. I'm not going to say for one second that it's easy, but it's a fine balance between um defending a boundary versus not feeling like you're a complete doormat so yeah it yeah. takes time but um i i from a lived experience perspective i can think of one example where i was watching a true crime documentary on tv and then all of a sudden alex ran into the room and said turn that off and i'm like why and he said because if you get dysregulated i'm the one that's going to have to deal with the fallout and i think that's where a lot of that actually comes from the boundary setting that if we do something that hurts ourselves then the carer the owners to like clean up and mop up the mess is all on you and I think there's uh, the distress regulation skills also help with that, that if your loved one is in distress, it's really not the end of the world and you can sit in all of that uncomfortability. It's it's really not something that you can prevent and you're actually just going to drive yourself mad trying to prevent your BPD loved one from hurting themselves in that way. So it's, it's all about uh, deciding what's important to set the limits on and learning how to tolerate distress. Mm. And you're so right as well, Alex, that there is the, you know, we call it spiral learning with the with the program. And so there's many skills that, that have to be learned and practiced. Um, and what we're looking at is, is, is building the relationship, building trust and building support before we come in and, and putting all those boundaries up because there needs to be su support there and solid, solid support so that, our, our loved one, our family member, our partner, our child knows that that we're also there for them with the support and the validation as well. It's not just about putting up, yeah, these boundaries. All right, should we answer one more question very quickly and then I think it's time for us to wrap up. Have you, either of you two, seen anything um, that you'd like to answer? Oh, I wasn't looking at the comments to right, be quite I know. so just thought I'd pop it out there um this is actually a really great question I think uh mm -hmm. what support out there is for the lived experience person um uh other than dbt what what other Ooh. programs are out there well, I would actually say that there are there, um, DBT is not the be all and end all, and there are actually quite exhaustive lists of resources out there. A good place for you to start would be, I mean, I don't know where the person who asked this question is based. Um, if you've heard of Project Air or Spectrum or the BPD Foundation, if you go to their websites, you will find lists of resources, particularly with the Project Air website, they will actually have information about um, evidence-based treatments for um, BPD 
And that extend to things like schema therapy, narrative therapy, mentalization based therapy. It's there's so much more out there that's um other than DBT. I, I get quite upset when people see that DBT is the be all and end all. It's an important piece of the puzzle and it works for a lot of people, but it might not work for everybody. That's true. So yeah, we can actually put those in the comments. Thank you. And I'll just make one more comment too that it's not it took it took us a very long time to realize that there are more things that can help than just, I guess, the mm. medical perspective. For the longest time, we thought that the only way to deal with this high emotion, whatever diagnosis, is through psychologists, psychiatrists, medication, diagnoses. Mm. And whilst that is important, that's very useful, but... There is a whole range of other help that is out there. For example, um, peer support workers, peer workers, people who have had lived experiences of distress, uh, mental health challenges, who are trained to listen to people, to go, to navigate, um, to navigate the system with people. That's been tremendously helpful. And like what Belinda was saying, family connections they don't actually ask you whether or not the person has a diagnosis or what medication they're on, et cetera. None of that ever got brought up during the course. So I think just understanding, just, just even knowing that there are other types of help out there other than just medication or just doctors is super, mm -hmm. it, it, is a game changer. And I'm absolutely, not rising on medical professionals they are super they are important but that in that that extra perspective i thought is important yeah the different things help is and it's it's all a matter of experimenting to find out what is the thing that works for you what works for me is art therapy i also like trauma-informed yoga things like that it's all just a matter of actually trying to get those supports wherever you find them and experiment and sort of figure out what actually gels with you Thank you so much. Um, I yeah, really, really enjoyed this today's talk. Uh, and I hope everyone in our audience has too. I'm sure they have. Uh, thank you so much to the both of you for sharing your time and your energy and your preparation with us today. And thank you for our audience as well for turning up today. Uh, give yourselves a pat on the back for showing up for yourself and your families. Um, so as I said before, we'll be sending a recording of this out in the coming fortnight. Um, and I just want to take an opportunity as well to say thank you to all the wonderful people who have donated with their registration. And for those who are yet to donate, if you have found value in today's presentation and you're in a position to donate a small amount, we would be really grateful. Um, I will send you out a link, um, that you might not know that our entire organisation is run by volunteers. We have two part-time employees. I am one of them on very minimal hours. We don't receive any current and currently don't receive any government funding. And we do rely entirely on the generosity of donations from the community in order to keep operating uh, and for us to keep delivering more of our free Family Connections programs. If you would like to find out more about Family Connections, please head to our website, which is www.bpdaustralia.org. I will also be sending you all an email tomorrow with an email address, which is familyconnections at bpdaustralia.org for you to find out a bit more information on the Family Connections programs, or if you've got any questions, send them through to there uh, and we can help you. We're not running any more programs for 2023, but we, we are beginning programs again in January and February. Um, so if you can get on the wait list, um, depending on your area, the wait list is often around three to six months. Invitations go out regularly, um, but the places do fill up because we've got really limited places. So if you do get an invitation, we recommend that you accept it if you can make it. Um, well, thank you once again. Um, that's it from us today. Thank you so much, Alison and Alex, again. Thank you to everybody thank you. who came and supported us. Um, we really enjoy, um, you know, hosting you and hosting these webinars. Uh, and, oh, we've ended up at the end of the year and you've done our final one for us. So thank you so much for it's all your support. It's been a pleasure.
Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. All the best, everyone. Thank you so much.